He has made me glad is our beginning song. Stand up, let's sing and clap. He has made me glad. Rise up, O men of God. this morning is a responsive reading that's in your bulletin. Thank you for the new bulletin, by the way. It's good stuff. Um, on on uh, the kids, return, kids and teachers return to school this week, so please uh, read along. As we begin this new school year, we give thanks that God has given us the ability to learn many things in many ways. We learn in school, but we also learn in church, in our family, in our community, and in the world. Learning is a gift from God. The Bible tells us that Jesus learned and studied, just as we do. And Jesus grew in wisdom. We ask God's blessing on this new school year, that it may be a time when we appreciate and fully use God's gift of learning. We ask God to bless our schools and teachers. We ask God to bless our classmates and friends. We ask God to bless our principals, counselors, and librarians. We ask God to bless those who prepare our lunches, those who drive us to school, and those who keep our schools clean and safe. We give thanks to God for the gift of learning. We pray that you will bring safety and peace, love and understanding to every school across our land challenge us to be a disciple and a witness to our friends and classmates. We, we renew our, our commitment to learn from the greatest teacher of all, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. Please be seated. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. We're glad everyone chose to come be with us at Mount Zion United Methodist Church this morning here in southwest Atlanta. Do we have any first-time visitors this morning? If you would please raise your hand up. All right, good. It's good to see everyone again. Um, my name is Jonathan. I'm filling in for Drew Pittman this week. Are there any uh, announcements? There's several over on the, um, the back of the bulletin or page four of the bulletin. Oh, the first one I need to mention is the flowers this week are to the glory of God and in celebration of Reverend Chris Rapko becoming our new shepherd with love from the Mount Zion sheep. <laughs> yeah. um, while I'm up here, 
Happy, birth happy birthday to my, uh, my niece, Morgan Love. <laughs> headed, uh, headed back to Athens soon, so I wanted to wish you a happy birthday. Any announcements? There are several on the back uh, of the bulletin. Food pantry needs, um, Project 1213, and thanks to those that contributed for the AC compressor. Um, yeah, yeah, we're having a meeting right after church today, the uh, SPRC. Um, depending on how many folks are here, we'll try and meet in the bride's room, but right after the service today, if we have too many, we'll go upstairs to the choir practice room. Yes, ma'am. In our very, very fancy bulletin, one, two, maybe page three. I don't know how we're. I don't know how we're counting. Um, you'll see some dates there, and so I want to make sure you notice, especially two of them. August fourteenth is the end of summer slip and slide shin dig. Say that three times real fast. And so if you were here for VBS, we did the slip and slide, and it is so much fun. Everybody is invited to do this. This is not just for children. This is all of you. So if you dare, if you dare, be ready. We're having hot dogs and chips after church that Sunday, and then we're going to play on the slip and slide for a little bit and uh, just have an end of summer fun. And then, of course, I do not want you to uh, forget September 18th when we are going to honor our music director for his 40 years of service. So make sure you have those two dates. There are others on here, and, and uh, we'll talk about those later, but I want to make sure you have those two on your calendar. Thank you, Carol. Just so there's no confusion on the slip and slide, if you haven't seen that before, there's two <laughs> hills over there. One of them is in the parking lot on concrete. We do not do the slip and slide on that. We do it in the grass, so it's nice, safe, soft landing. I've done it, but it's been a few years, and it's, it's a lot of fun, so try and get that on your calendar. Any other announcements? Rosie I'm Love. Still, I'm still looking for a sanctuary flower uh, person to donate uh, for August 14. That's the last uh, availability that I have for next month. So if you want to uh, donate the flowers for August 14, please let me know. August 14. August 14. August 14. <laughs> See Rosie for uh, reserving the flowers. There's someone else over on. All right. Just wanted to let you know that I will be out of the office this week from Monday to Wednesday. Our normal office hours are Monday to Thursday, 9.30 to 3.30. Uh, I had a, uh, a, a show that I was supposed to go see in Washington, D.C. in the year 2020 that I bought tickets to in February 2020. Such optimism. I had such <laughs> optimism about that. Uh, and so that got canceled twice, and I am getting to go see it uh, in D.C. this week. So. Um, uh, I, uh, thank you for your patience as I return. I'll be back in the office on Thursday, and any business that needs to be done, I can be reached in. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is that Moby? Who are you going to? Oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. Yes, ma'am, Marcia. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That was we're we're blessed to have people here that can step in and handle things like that. So it was. Um, we'll keep keep Steve in our prayers. Any uh, any prayer, other prayer requests this morning, Josh? Uh, Rosa and her family. Rosa and her family. Yes, sir. Matt Morris. Uh, I didn't ask for any prayers.
Hernandez family, yes, sir. Any others? Maybe. Steve Upchurch. Steve Upchurch. Jeff. Ann Pope. Ann Pope. She's recovering from COVID. Alan. Barbara Prater. Yes, ma'am. That was Ramonda? Ramonda. Ramonda, yes, ma'am. Rita? DJ Mance. DJ Mance. Mance. Okay. But she's doing a little better, but this time she's got broken toes. Okay. She's doing a little better, but she's doing pretty well. Excellent. If there are no more, please, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm sorry. It's okay. Praise God. Amen. Thank you. Yep. Yes, ma'am. I just feel that all of you need to be thankful. And I, I love y'all because y'all, oh, God, y'all do so good to my family. Thank you. Thank you. We all thank you for everyone. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have a, a, a praise as well, as well that I'll, I'll uh, mention. I've got several. Uh, Cousins that can sing really, really well and have sung many times in this building. Uh, we had choir practice this past Thursday night, and I've heard a song that I've heard Drew sing probably hundreds of times, and it was just uh, incredible. Amen. And so we're uh, truly blessed in many ways uh, at this church. So um, let's bow our heads and, and thank God and go to prayer. And sustains God who is an ever present calming force in our lives God who forgives as we forgive be with us now we pray we lift to you those names of these children of yours so that you can do what you do which is what we can't do for them only we pray that we might be your agents in this world that needs your healing to provide what we can provide because of you. Make us your hands and your feet, O oh God, that we might be a people who point others to hope, that we might give people the strength of a thousand Beyonce's in the face of trials and their hopelessness to have the courage to stand up and say, you won't break my soul and to take that next step with you, O oh God. That next step with you is our hope, O oh God, and we ask you to make our hope a reality. We pray these things in the name of the one who walked with us and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
are a student, if you are a student who is going back to school at any time in the next couple of weeks, I know it might be strange in other parts of the, our state, but if you are a student, I would love for you to come up uh, and as we would love to bless you, and also if you're a teacher or faculty at any school, if you're going back to school in the next little bit, come on down. We're going to pray over you. We would like to bless your time coming up. We're, now, as you're coming down, when you get here, I want you to lift up a thumbs up if you're excited to go back to school, or a thumbs down. <laughs> Look at all these folks. Look at all of these young folks and some of us not as young. <laughs> not pointing at anyone, right? We are so blessed by you. A lot of folks say that uh, our kids are the church of tomorrow, right? I disagree. I completely disagree because you are the church of today. You are our leaders today, and we want you to lead at school when you go back. And some of our leaders in our church today are a little older, and we want you to lead at school as well to point people in the right direction. I can't wait to see how God blesses you this year. And so if you will, bow with me as we pray. If you are in the congregation or in the choir, I would love for you to outstretch a hand to these folks as we bless them. God of fresh starts and new beginnings, we bring ourselves, our big feelings, and our backpacks to you. In our backpacks, we carry blank pages Sharpen pencils, pointy crayons, and in our hearts we carry big feelings, unanswered questions, and hopeful expectations. There are endless possibilities of what this new year might bring, of what we might learn, of who we might meet, and who we might become. God, our friend, who is always with us, be with us through it all. Be with us as we ride the bus. Be with us as we walk. Be with us as we buckle seatbelts and zip, zip up jackets and tie shoes. However we get there, whatever we wear, bless this journey into something new, O oh God. For the grown-ups going back to school, with us, God, be with them too. Thank you for our teachers, our helpers, our caregivers, and our leaders, and for all that they do to help us learn and grow. Give them the patience that they need to be your servants for our children to mold their minds and to help them grow in wisdom and in stature just as your son, Jesus Christ, did. Give our teachers and staffs full hearts of love and help them to know the right thing to say at the right time. During a time when the teaching profession is under more and more scrutiny, O oh God, give our teachers and faculty spirits of full integrity before you and their peers. Bless them, O oh God, because they, we know that they are doing your work. God, our friend who's full of wonder, fill their hearts and bless their hands. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God be with you. God be with you. I know God is with you. Thank you all. Our next hymn this morning is number 399. Let's please stand and sing. Take my life and let it be.
invite the ushers to come forward at this moment. As they're coming forward, I want to thank you for the ways that you give to this church in your time, your presence, your gifts, your offering, offerings. Uh, one of the ways that you support this church is at the gathering that happened today. The gathering that happened across the street at 10 o'clock, it was a fabulous service. If you haven't been, I was uplifted. I know you will be too. But that's just one of the things that your money goes toward as you give back to God. And so as we do that together now, let us pray. Oh God, we stand before you as a people of faith, investing our lives and our treasures for the glory of your kingdom, not storing them selfishly for ourselves. We pray now that you would bless these gifts, your tithes and our offerings, and those who gave them. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. remain standing for our scripture reading this morning. It's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. It's on page uh, 74 if you have your pew Bibles, or it's going to be right up here. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, 
friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. This time we'd like for the children to come down for the children's message. Please be seated. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Are you all excited about school? You can be honest. Okay. Okay. There we go. There we go. I mean, I'm excited. It's going to be, it's going to be a good time. It's going to be fun. You get to see your friends again. That's good, right? Do you all know what this is? You know what this app is that I have pulled up? Calculator. What do we do with this? Solve problems. Add a bunch of high numbers together. So if I did like 1,237,319 times 2020, could y'all tell me what that is right quick? You need some paper. You got it? <laughs> you, need a, you need a minute? But I can put it in here, right? And it'll tell me. Do you know who doesn't need a calculator? God. God doesn't need a calculator, does he? It says that God knows how many hairs are on our head. How about that? You know what else God knows? How many stars are out there? You know what uh, scientists guess how many stars there are out there? The number 20. Let's see. It says the number one with 24 zeros after it. That's a lot, isn't it? That is a lot. But there's actually more than that. They're just guessing, right? So God only knows how many stars. So what we're going to talk about is if God knows that, God knows all those things, he knows everything at all times, when we feel worried that God won't take care of us, should we be worried? No, God's got it, right? So he's always going to take care of us. If he knows how many hairs and how many stars, then he knows us, right? He's going to take care of us. So... It says in Psalm 147, he counts the stars and calls them all by name. And it says in Luke, yes, God even knows how many hairs you have on your head. I'm going to show you all something. It says, if I put the number 37818 in this calculator, it might be hard to tell because Apple's got numbers that are not boxy. But can you all tell what that says? If you get a real calculator, you'll be able to see it. But that says Bible. Isn't that cool? So the number 37818 says Bible. Can you see it kind of right there? The comma in there kind of throws it off a little bit. But you see that? Isn't that cool? So when you get a real uh, calculator, does anybody here have a TI-83 plus yet? Yeah. Yes. There's some excitement. Ask your parents about that. Um, when you get older, you might have to have that in, in high school. There's actually games on it. So don't tell your teacher. She or she already knows there's games on it. But it's a lot of fun, okay? So that's a cool calculator. But put that in there, 37818. You can show your friends Bible. Isn't that cool? All right, I'm going to say a prayer, and I got some candy. All right, cool. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for each of these kids that are here uh, for an awesome school year ahead. We're thankful for that, to see our friends and to be a light for them and to uh, just honor you, God. And uh, we thank you for the ability to go to school and to learn and to use that to, uh, to do great things for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jake. As the kids go back to their seats or across the street, please stand up and greet your neighbors saying God loves you.
week. Uh, I think my wife gave me some kind of cold. It is not COVID. We tested for about five times. I mean, it was just, it is what it is. So uh, when I was preparing to come to Mount Zion, I was looking at what the lectionary had in store for me. Y'all know what the lectionary is, the revised common lectionary. Most, a lot of us, if you've grown up in the Methodist church, you know what the revised le common lectionary is. If you don't, that's okay. It's a schedule for passages for churches to use every week in their Sunday service. They give you one Old Testament, a psalm, uh, usually an epistle, uh, so one of Paul's letters or sometimes Acts, that kind of thing, and then a gospel text. And so I thought to myself, well, uh, I'm new here. I'm going to preach probably on the gospel texts. So, um, come to find out, I have a bone to pick with the Revised Common Lectionary, because it's not very nice to incoming pastors. <laughs> Believe you me, I'd rather not begin my time with you talking about money. It feels like grabbing the third rail with both hands. I'd rather talk about all the nice things, like God being love, and... The importance of prayer, which actually the, the lectionary blessed us with last week. Or the importance of service and faith in our discipleship. But being faithful to God in my preaching means that I don't avoid the hard topics. That rather I lean into them. And talk about the hard things that Jesus said. Because even Jesus said, even though Jesus said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, who are tired and worn down and beat down. And Jesus said, I will give you rest because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus said all those things. But Jesus also had some hard and heavy things to say about money. And so we're going to talk about one of those things today. Now, his words here remind me a little bit of someone else's, I hesitate to call it preaching, um, because you'll see who it is in just a second, but discussion maybe about the way that we understand our material possessions. One of my favorite comedians is George Carlin. Now, if you know who George Carlin is, you probably would be like, oh, Chris, where are you going with this? <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. I've got you. I've got you. I love his observational humor, even if I didn't agree with every single thing that he said, or even the majority of the things that he said, especially his philosophy. But he had a bit about stuff. Do you remember this bit? Do any of you know this bit? Here's some of what he said, and don't worry, I chose lines selectively, so there, there won't be profanity. But he said things that I think contain God's truth for us this morning. He said, that's all you need in life, a little place for your stuff. That's all your house is, a place to keep your stuff. If you didn't have so much stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. <laughs> that's what your house is, a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. More stuff. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta move, gotta get a bigger house. Why? No room for your stuff anymore. Did you ever notice that you go to someone else's house? You never feel quite 100% at home? It's because you have no place to put your stuff. <laughs> no room for your stuff. Carlin was brilliant at something <laughs> called deconstruction, which is breaking down our ideas and our practices and our beliefs and just the things that go on in our mind and exposing them for, I guess, what he thought they, they were. Sometimes they are close to reality. Sometimes I would argue with him a little bit. But on this one, I think he's close to right. Pretty close. I agree with him on this one. Many of us in this country are in, on a mission to acquire more stuff. 
That mission is sometimes labeled the American dream, going from rags to riches, going from nothing to everything. Should it surprise us to hear that the American dream is sometimes at odds with God's dream? That the accumulation of wealth and stuff is not the end-all, be-all, determining factor of success in this lifetime. I don't blame anyone here who thinks subconsciously, whether they're aware of it or not, that the accumulation of stuff is a worthy goal for anybody. Our society, and especially our popular culture, thrives, demands the accumulation of stuff. I'm not immune to that quest myself. I am obsessed with having the newest technology. I'm one of those people who's going to be beating down the door on the first day of the new iPhone sale, okay? Um, I actually was for iPhone 13. I will not be for iPhone 14, but I digress. I'm using a, a computer right now that's a 2019 Mac, and I'm dying to go get a new one. My fingers are itching for it. I want that new Apple silicone. My wife levels this criticism at me all the time. She says, Chris, you have to be up on the cutting edge of everything that's going on in the world. Can you calm down and just be pleased with what you have for a minute? And it's a valid criticism. That's one that she levels at me all the time. We have shows that showcase the houses of celebrities, where they have rooms, the entire my size bedroom rooms for their shoes. For their shoes, y'all, for sneakers. Not even all their shoes, just for their sneakers. <laughs> Being a sneakerhead, that does appeal to me. I think it also appeals to my wife, who wants a place for everything in the household. She wants a place. If she sees something on the counters, we are doing things wrong. <laughs> That's the kind of person my wife is. Uh, and so I think, in some respects, she's not immune to that either. Uh, but this is something that uh, appeals to my sensibilities this morning as well. The gospel has significance, my friends, for how we live every single part of our lives. From the privacy of our homes, to our life in church together, to our life at work and at school together, for some of us, those two things are the same thing. To our life in the eye of the public and our civic responsibilities, there's not one thing that Jesus did not touch. If it's moral, Jesus has a word to say about it. And everything, my friends, is moral from where we do our grocery shopping to how we do a church budget. Everything has morality attached to it. In today's passage, Jesus calls into question the basis for our entire economic system. I don't know if you can tell who's up on this screen, but we got Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, and Elon Musk, three of the richest people in the entire world. They thrive off of capitalism. Now, I'm not here to say that capitalism is evil. I think every economic system has evil in it in the entire world. But God's ways are not our ways. Even in the economy of the kingdom of God, our economic system, and I'm talking worldwide, exists in ways that allow for vast wealth accumulation by both private and corporate Groups. Jesus says to us today that in the kingdom of God, we do not operate from a perspective of getting everything that we can for the sake of itself. In other words, our end goal in this life is not getting money. It's not getting things. It's just not. It's just not. And when we look at what is celebrated in our popular culture, it's not hard to see that Jesus is an always will be and always has been offering us a new and better way to understand our lives in relationship to the material world. The world surrounding us should look at Christians and say, 
these guys are different. These women are different. These people are different. They don't care about having the nicest house on the block, and they don't care about having that next new car or that next new Apple laptop. <laughs> they try to live within their means. And please hear me again. I think you can tell that this is as much a sermon for me as it is for you, because I like nice things too. I like the new car smell. I like having a big enough kitchen for two people to work in. I like comfort. And maybe that's what Jesus is telling us, is that we need to give up some of our comfort and get to be uncomfortable for the cause of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that the gospel might take hold in this world through our personal and our collective witness. And I'll tell you that I think this is part of what Jesus means when he says in John chapter 15 and John chapter 17 that we are to be of the world, and not rather, not of the world, to be in the world, but not of the world. In other words, we don't belong to the world, we belong to God. We are called to resist the systems that keep us from living into the full reign of God in every aspect of our lives, whatever that system is. And friends, our economic system, not just here in America, but worldwide, is one of those systems that keeps pushing us to our goals that are often at odds with God's will in our lives, God's will for the kingdom. In a world that produces a ton of Gordon Geckos, y'all know who Gordon Gecko is from the movie Wall Street by Oliver Stone. He lived by the motto, greed is good. Christians are called to be a people who respond, greed is not of God. Instead of cash rules everything around me, cream, get the money, dollar, dollar bill, y'all. It should be God rules everything around me. Money, I want you to hear this. Money and material possessions are a part of this world. They are a vital part of this world. But they are a small part of it, and certainly not the only thing that matters to us as a people of God. And Jesus, like many others in the Bible, connects the fertility of greed to death. The common refrain of Ecclesiastes is that everything is something called, the Hebrew word is hevel. Hevel is a fleeting breath. It's a vapor that disappears as soon as it comes out of your mouth. The, gospel, or the, the Bible in, or translators interpret this word as vanity, meaninglessness. The quest for wealth and stuff is no exception because he says, but when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had worked so hard to achieve, I realized that it was pointless. A chasing after the wind, there's that word hevel again. Nothing is to be gained under the sun. The writer of Ecclesiastes would not get to enjoy the fruits of his labor. That would be left to his heir. Death strips away the material meaning from this life in very, very powerful ways. Working in Hapeville and now in Mount Zion, I got to uh, have the privilege of knowing Jeff Colquitt uh, because uh, I got many calls to do funerals at Donahue Lewis. Uh, before I even came here to Mount Zion, I would fill in for Josh when he wasn't available uh, and when the family didn't have a pastor but they wanted a Christian service. And so um, I understand that as part of my role in this community to offer folks who, who need someone to walk with them and through grief a hand, a shoulder to lean on. It's rare that I preach the funeral there that I knew the person. Uh, in fact, I don't think I ever have. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because death has a way of stripping away and things that are superfluous in life, the things that don't actually matter. 
and revealing what we understand to be the most important parts of our lives. Not one person who I'm talking to about their deceased loved one ever says, oh, he really knew how to save his money. <laughs> you should have seen the size of his bank account. <laughs> or, wow, you should have seen her house. It was huge. <laughs> no, it's always, she loved kids and would do anything for her family. Or he would give someone the shirt off of his back, which is always a masculine metaphor, by the way. <laughs> or it's stories about how they've helped someone in need. Not one, not one person worth talking about wants to be remembered by how much money they saved or the amount of wealth that they acquire because in death it truly does not matter. We want to be eulogized for the good that we did in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the kind of model that we were of love to everyone, especially our friends and our family. For the kind of person that we were, not for the material possessions that we have. If you're at my funeral and someone stands up and says, oh, Chris had the nicest yacht in the world, I would like you to remove that person from that room immediately because they are lying to you to your face. <laughs> That's thing number one. Thing number two, because I don't want to be remembered for that. What we want most in different words, is for people to remember how rich we were toward God. Those are Jesus' words, by the way, in that passage. I'm reminded of my favorite version of Ebenezer Scrooge, Frank Cross, from the movie Scrooge. If y'all know this movie, it's one of my favorites. Frank, uh, just as in every adaptation of The Christmas Carol, Frank comes to terms with his mortality uh, when he realizes, after the third ghost visits him, the ghost of Christmas future, that he is watching his funeral. There are two people there. He realizes that he should have been pouring his love into people, the people that matter, instead of pouring his love into work and greed. And the repentance that comes after this realization is why I love this movie so much. Well, that and the, the Ghost of Christmas Present just beats him senseless. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> no, one does, no one does physical comedy like Bill Murray, in my opinion. He's great. Uh, but So when he realizes that he's still alive, the repentance is so real. He interrupts a live show of The Christmas Carol to tell folks about his conversion. I don't think he was converted to Christianity, but I think he was converted to doing good for other people. Instead of pouring his energy and time and love and stuff into stuff, into more stuff. The language being used by Frank isn't being rich toward God, like Jesus says, but I think... That is exactly what we're talking about here, using our time and our resources toward the kingdom and God's purposes rather than our selfish desires and ambitions. There's a way to do that. John Wesley put it very, very well when he preached a sermon called The Use of Money. And he called on those who would hear and later read his words to use three rules, uh, he was a big man of three rules, uh, but he used three rules when it comes to how we should be good stewards of the monetary resources that God has given us. First, we're to make all we can. Make all the money we can. Good advice, I like that. Uh, I'm, on, I'm with it so far, John, you did a great <laughs> job. If only we could stop there, right? 
make all the money you can, and not by any means you can, not by any means. If the means by which you accrue your money are evil and they do harm, John Wesley said, absolutely not. Find another job. Do whatever it takes. Thing number one, make all the money you can. Thing number two, save all the money you can. Doesn't Jesus in our passage talk about not building storehouses for our material possessions that we've worked for? I think so, John. What are you doing? What are you talking about? The third rule is the most important. It's what differentiates those first two rules from our world economy right now. And it's the purpose of making all the money you can and saving all the money you can. And the, the purpose is rule number three, get, so that you can give all the money you can. That's the difference. That is the difference between our economy in this world and God's economy. The economy of the kingdom of God and what is happening in our world right now. We can give all we can, and that's really the difference. In God's kingdom, there's not room for wealth accumulation and building storehouses. We're to use our resources so that those who have needs have their needs fulfilled. And it's so excellent. I cannot stress this enough. It is so excellent to be in a place that cares about people's needs being met. I'm so proud of this church. When people ask me about what we're doing at that food window and with Project 1213 and trying to meet the needs of this community, I brag on this place so much. I am so proud of you all. We can do more. We can, and we're going to do more. And I'm so excited about where God takes us. But we're doing well collectively to give all we can. We're following that third rule, I think, pretty well. Here is maybe an uncomfortable question for you, though. How's that going for you personally? How is the giving all you can going for you personally? And I'm not just talking about money, because we are a congregation with different means in this place. I'm talking about giving all of yourself whether it's your time, your presence, your service, your gifts, all the things that we promised to give the United Methodist Church when we join it. How's that going? Are you following that rule personally? I was, I was reading recently uh, an article on how adolescents don't know how to manage their money. What a huge surprise. I had no idea how to manage my money when I was 16 years old. Uh, this, this young lady might be even younger than that. I don't know. I certainly didn't by the time I was her age. It took me getting married to figure out how to use money. <laughs> my wife made sure of it very quickly. <laughs> Have you all heard of Green Light? It's a debit card for kids that kind of helps them how to manage their money. It's a great idea, uh, but one of the key factors in why kids don't know anything about money is because adults are afraid to talk to them about it. It's our reluctance to talk openly about our money and the way that we spend it and what our priorities are. To talk about our practices and what we do with that money. Now, doing so, being that open, being, being like that, being honest with our children, I think, takes some courage. But specifically for giving, I want our children in this place, and I want my children, child right now, to know why. I'm giving money back to God. Why I'm trying to be rich toward God. To know why we don't go out and buy the next Apple computer as soon as it comes out in this family. 
to know why we do what we do with our money, with our resources, with our material wealth. I want our kids to know in this church why we give what we give, what that money goes toward. And I want them to, to know that giving is our priority. Because I believe, and I hope you do too, that God will use what we give to expand the kingdom of God, both here in Atlanta and around the world. I want Jordan to know that saving for her future and for my wife and I's retirement is just as important to me as being rich toward God. I believe in financial literacy, y'all. I'm not telling you to go give away a million dollars that you don't have. No one's saying that. God is asking you this morning to give all you can, to identify those places where you can give. And it doesn't look the same for everyone. Sometimes we do fall short. I think all of us here could probably acknowledge that we fall short in giving what we could give. I am also aware that we are doing the sermon after we have fulfilled a $30,000 need in our church in two weeks. Amen. So I'm not, I'm, believe me, I am aware of this. I want you to know that. But I also want us to embrace honesty in our finances. If we had the courage to be honest, and not just in this area of our discipleship, but in every area of our discipleship, it would set this church on fire. And I'm not talking about uh, getting insurance money. I'm talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Please do not set this church on fire. But I want the Holy Spirit to come and light us all on fire so that we can grow in our discipleship and in numbers. I think honesty will revolutionize the church. And so how can we be richer toward God together? How can we give our gifts of money, our time, our presence, and our service, our talents, in the way that God is calling us to do? How are we falling short of that goal? Search yourself this week. Ask God to figure out how you can be richer toward God. And I'll do the same. In the name of the one who gave all for us. Amen. Amen. For closing hymn number 593, we'll stand and sing the first verse. Here I am, Lord. Receive this benediction in the name of God. Search yourselves this week. Search yourselves. Find out with God where you are lacking in giving of yourself, giving all that you can 
of yourself. And I will do the same. Go in peace to love and to serve in the name of God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.